All right, I'm going to go ahead and get started. Um, so this session, I hope, is a conversation. I was really hoping it would be a conversation um, in person. Um, so you can unmute yourself or unmute your video or show your video and ask questions or add comments anytime you'd like. Um, you can drop them in chat. I'll try to take a break every couple slides and look at what's in chat, but I'm not very good at reading and talking and listening at the same time. Um, so feel free to just jump in. Um, I wanted to have a conversation about how we can best help companies um, be good participants in the open source software world. Um, just a little bit of background on myself. I've spent my entire 20 year career in open source software, um, bridging the gap between companies and open source software. Um, so at Hewlett Packard, I started the one of the very first open source programs offices. Um, I went on to work at a number of nonprofits and with a number of communities. And I've always kind of bridged the gap between helping companies figure out how to work with open source software and figure, helping nonprofits figure out how to ask companies for, for help or for money or to work better with them. So I thought this would be a great thing to discuss together because I'm sure a lot of you are in the same boat. Um, and so let's let's have a conversation. Um, let's see what we know as a group. Um, I just put together a bunch of um, just general topic slides and I can talk to any of them for a while, um, but you're also welcome to jump in. Um, so one of the very first things I think is really important when you're trying to get a company to get involved in your project is to be really clear what your governance model is. Um, because especially to, to people that are new to open source software and then to their entire management chain and the other people in the company that have never heard of open source software, how and why people work on open source software is really confusing to them. So I think it's really important to be clear about how you make decisions, um, who the decision makers are, um, who they should go to if they have questions, like just being really clear about how things work um, so that they can convince their management or their peers that this is like something they can work with. Any, any thoughts on that or anything anyone else wants to share? If everyone wouldn't mind dropping in chat, like your name and what your role is, or you do you work for a project for a company, which which part of this um, conversation do you want to be a part of? Um, that'd be a great way to get started. So if you see on the right, there's like a chat and there's like an event chat and a session chat. If you could jump, drop in the session chat, like your name and, and what you're interested in learning here, that would be awesome. So another topic that it comes up a lot um, whenever I talk about companies and open source software is how to ask for money. I think there's a lot of ways that companies can participate in open source software that's way beyond money um, with like people and resources and, and contributions and code. Um, but I think it's important to point out um, how to ask for money and, and how to do it well. Um, so I, I was just gonna spend a few minutes talking about that. Um, first, I think if you want money from a company, um, your ask needs to be really specific. Um, so you need to tell them how much money you want. So don't go and say, would you donate to my project? Um, I've had conferences come and say, would you would you sponsor our, our, our conference? And it's like, well, for how much? And well, what do we get? So I think the first thing is to be really specific um, about what it is that that you want from the, the project. Like, do you, are you asking for $5,000? Are you asking for $50,000? Um, and then I think it's really, and is it for a year or is it a one-time thing? Um, and then I think it's really important to say like what they're going to get out of it. And, and you don't have to give them the keys to the kingdom. You don't have to tell them that they can run the project if you give them, if they give you a hundred thousand. Um, but you need to be clear about what it is. What are they going to get? Are they going to get um, any kind of recognition? Are they going to get a logo on your sponsor's website? Um, are they going to get a, a vanity URL in your project? Are they going like what, what's, in it for the company in the sense of like, how are they gonna sell this to someone? And most likely if you're an open source software project asking for money, um, the easiest group for the person that's trying to help you get money out of their company, the easiest group for them to go to is usually the marketing group. Um, so usually if you can give them any kind of advertising recognition, um, like logos or banners at conferences, um, that's really helpful. The other thing that people often give 
is, is an advisory board seat. Um, so usually a lot of projects have a board of directors or a group of maintainers who make decisions. And they often, when they're starting to look for, for help from financial help from companies, they create a board of advisors. Um, and companies are okay that the board of advisors is not running the project. Um, you could perhaps give them um, responsibility for the money since they're the ones donating the money. Maybe if you donate $10,000, you get a seat on the advisory board um, and you get to decide how the money is spent in marketing. And that's probably actually helpful because then you don't have to manage that money or the conference is spent. Um, so an advisory board is something often that projects give um, to help companies sell, to help their sponsors at companies um, sell the sponsorship within the company. Um, another thing, I, I talked about logos and brand um, placements. Another thing is conference sponsorships. Um, when I was executive director of the Ganon Foundation, I had one particular company that had a really hard time sponsoring the Ganon Foundation. Like it, it just didn't fit in any kind of bucket they had. Um, they couldn't just give us money, but they could give us lots of money for Guadic, which was our annual conference, still is the Ganon's annual conference. Um, so they would sponsor Guadic at like a premium platinum plus level um, in order to help us throughout the year. Um, so a conference was something their marketing group really understood, understood the value of, was willing to commit to. And thanks people for, for dropping in your, your names and what you're interested in the chat. So I, I encourage the rest of you to drop in to chat and uh, just introduce yourself and, and what you're interested in talking about here today. Um, the other thing with companies is it's, it's really hard to get them to approve money the very first time um, but if you can make that reoccurring, that's usually pretty easy because once it's in the budget once, um, it stays in the budget forever. Not always, but like make your make your request reoccurring. So like make it an annual membership or make it an annual conference sponsorship because um, it's much easier to get it to, to happen over and over again every year. While you're on the topic of like reoccurring things, Companies have like really strange fiscal budget years. So um, I worked at one company where the fiscal year started in February, not January, but February. Um, I now work at Microsoft where our fiscal year starts in July and we are like halfway through fiscal year 2021 at this point, as confusing as that is. And if, if projects can work with our fiscal year, that's much more helpful. So like at Microsoft, I had much less it's much harder for me to sponsor for the year 2020 and much easier for me to pay you for a year that starts in July 2021 or July 2020 that goes, that's actually my July 2021 in a weird way. Um, so work with the companies on when they'll have budget. And I actually talked to someone who would keep track of all of the companies and when their fiscal year started and when it ended. And a couple months before the fiscal year ended, he would contact them and say, hey, we're really looking for some extra money. I was wondering if you had any left in the budget. And he could often get, you know, 10, 20K from different companies um, because they still had money left in the budget and their fiscal year was about to end. And then give them things when you're asking for money, give them things that they can share with their management. So tell them what you did with their money. Um, give them a if you're asking for a conference sponsorship, give them a brochure, like something that looks kind of professional with like the levels, like give them something that when they go ask their management or their company or their whoever in their financial people in their company, give them something they can show them forward to them and say, this is what I want to sponsor. It's much easier for them if they can show a nice brochure than if it's just an email describing how they want to give money to this organization no one's ever heard of within the company. Any other, um, any points anyone has about money or asking for money, any difficulties you've had, any questions you'd like to ask? All right, I see we have a question from Rich and he's interested in understanding um, how to help companies that open source, understand that open source software projects are not their projects. Um, are you talking about projects that they've started or projects that they're joining? You wanna elaborate on that, Rich? You wanna unmute yourself? And I think Rich is probably actually really busy doing that. I can actually other unmute myself because I'm the organizer. But uh, you know, when we deal with companies at, at Apache, that donate a project to the foundation and then they want to keep the reins on it. And you see this a lot with project with companies that open source something and then don't understand that it's not theirs anymore. So that was kind of the, the situation and how to do that gently. So you're not stomping on them and irritating them. Right. Cause they just donated something good and they really want other people to participate. So how do you get them to kind of take a step back so that other people can play? Um, I, th I think 
I've run into that at Microsoft too. And I actually think it's, they have a really good culture that we're asking them to, to change or exchange for another good culture. Um, and it's really interesting. So like at Microsoft, there's a really strong culture of ownership for your code. So if I create a tool that I'm using internally and it's super useful and I put it out there and 10 other teams start using it, if any of them have a problem with that tool, they're gonna contact me and I'm gonna fix it because it's my code and I'm responsible for it and I stand behind it. And they're not gonna fix it because like it's my code and they wouldn't wanna step on my toes. Um, and so when we move to like the inner source, open source model, um, we're trying to encourage those other teams to just fix it. And, and to them, it feels a little bit like they're stepping on someone's toes. And to the owner of the code, like say if it was me, it feels a little bit like they're intruding in my space. Um, so I think it's a cultural change to explain to them that they have to like give some room for others to, to, to play. Um, I think it's a little bit like raising kids too, right? Like you have to let them make mistakes and do it wrong. You have to kind of take a step back and let them play with it, um, even though you could do it better or faster or easier. So I, I think it's a lot of talking and sharing and examples. Anybody else have ideas for Rich? Or any other questions? Yeah, I think it's it's really important to not not punish them for for wanting to still own it, but showing them how other people would like to to play along. Um, an, another area that I think is really important is updating the projects. Um, a lot of times, from it, maybe if if there's already like ten people from that company involved in in submitting code, you know, doing pull releases, pull requests, and and submitting code and issues. Maybe they're super involved in your project and they're following along. Um, but often it's usually only one or two people from the company involved in your project. And then the other people, there's a lot of other people in the company that are helping get that sponsorship or helping get that money or helping promote it. Um, and they're not really following along. Um, even though you've told them where your mailing list is, even though you would expect that they would sign up for your mailing list, even though you think they would go to your repo once in a while and, and look at the issues, they're not, they're probably not. Um, so the more you can send them stuff, even though it's extra work, the more you can update them, um, the better. So if you, if you can um, send them, you know, ro roadmaps in the sense of like, not we're going to release this now and this tomorrow and this the next day, but kind of what you're working on and what's important to you. If you could send them newsletters, um, if you can compile like a weekly update of what happened on the mailing list and send that to them. Um, if you can let them know that your meeting got recorded, um, like the Ceph project records all of its meetings and posts them on YouTube, just send them a little notice that says, hey, the, the last five meetings are on YouTube if you want to follow along. Last meeting, we had a really great discussion about this feature or this problem that people were seeing. Um, the more you can like update them, the more engaged they'll end up being and the more likely that they'll continue to sponsor your project. And I think it's really hard because we assume that obviously they would sign up for the project. Um, we have a Microsoft open source a project called Clearly Defined. Um, we have a lot of people that work on it, um, but the people that fiscally sponsor the project inside Microsoft are not on the mailing list and do not go to the meetings. Um, so we have to make sure that, you know, we meet with them every couple of weeks and tell them how the project's going and, and tell them what people are working on and then let them know that the, the fiscal support that they're offering is useful. Um, so I think it's really important to, to do that, to update them, even when you think it should be obvious. And then one thing I'd like to point out in particular, and I think I have it as a whole topic later, is, is security. Um, so security is really important to companies usually, and it's it's a little hard for them to navigate in the open source software world. Um, so I think letting them know how security updates happen, pinging them when there's issues, assuming that they're not following on the mailing list, I, I think is super important. All right, so I would normally pick on people in the audience, but I can't see you. So uh, if you want to join in and you want to like ask a question or you want to share an anecdote or if something I say doesn't jive with you and you think I'm wrong, like feel free to, to jump in, um, drop something in the chat and I'll read it. Or if you if you can unmute yourself, um, go ahead and do that. Um, so, so one of the things that I think is, is really important is to let companies know about opportunities. Um, and, and security is actually one that, that's happened quite a bit um, in my experience is that they're not aware that there's like a team that deals with security. There's, they're not aware that there's a mailing list. Um, 
and and they would participate and they would fix bugs and they you know issues that came up and they would share knowledge that they have from within their organization and expertise that they have across the organization but they didn't even know that that's how it happened um so they didn't even know there was a security team they could join um or they didn't know that there was a weekly video call on monday or they would have joined every monday because they're interested um or they don't know that there's a meetup that happens or an annual conference they should to talk to. So I, I know a lot of these things I'm saying kind of reiterate on the same thing, but like letting them know about opportunities and spending like half hour, an hour a week, just sending out updates to your corporate members, like to, um, or, or ask the people in your project, Hey, you know, you work for, you know, um, auto company, whatever. Um, are there people in, in your company that I should update that I could send this newsletter to? Or, or here's the stuff you could forward to them um, and let them know what they could forward. Um, the other thing that I think um, is, is often confusing to projects, and I would love um, any input you have on what advice we could give to companies to make this better, is that often at a company, um, there's a lot of switching of who works on a project. Um, I've heard this feedback about Microsoft, for example. Um, someone will join the project, um, submit a pull request, maybe two of a pull requests, um, respond to a couple issues, and then they'll just like disappear and somebody else from the company will show up and be the one contributing next. Um, and I know like in, in Microsoft's case, we have often teams of people that are working on a project and they'll try to rotate responsibilities so that there's not a single point of failure. Um, so there's a team of like 10 people um, and they depend on an Apache project for one thing. They'll often not assign one person to be the liaison for that Apache project. They'll expect all 10 people on their team to be able to fill in when it's needed. Um, and so that person might rotate like it, and the person doesn't rotate, but it's just a different person um, the next time you come. And I think that's confusing to the project, and I think it's hard on the company sometimes. Um, but to expect that and just to treat them, you know, treat these newcomers as people that want to be part of the project. Um, so I, I'd appreciate um, any advice or feedback you have on on how to help companies do that better. And and yeah, Rich, it really gets in the way of like the the reputation, you know, the personal reputation, right? Like if if I you know who I am and you can trust me if I've contributed. Uh, and if suddenly my colleague Greg shows up tomorrow, like how do you trust Greg, right? Um, it's, it's hard. Any, so for the new people coming in, if you could drop your name and what you're interested in talking about and feel free to, to join in via chat or whoever, um, taking questions throughout the session and taking any input or comments that other people have as well. Um, and the, the next one I wanted to talk about was just explaining things, um, especially when it comes to governance or how things work. I think it's not always obvious to, to all companies um, how things work. And so taking a few extra minutes to, to explain it, um, explaining who the key people are, why they got started, um, who they are, what their role in the project is, um, all the different places they might find information. Um, all the different things that, that might be involved, um, I think is, is really important um, to, to welcoming any new person, but in, in specific a company. And I would actually um, encourage everyone to write all this out somewhere in their project in their readme or you know some, somewhere obvious when you get started in the project on your web page, um, how things in your project work and how people can expect to be involved and, and how they can um, and how they can grow or evolve to that role. So the other thing in governance is companies are often interested. They're willing, I think they would be more willing to invest if it was clear where their investment would go. So if they said, okay, we have to grow a single person. We can't rotate those 10 people team through and get anywhere very quickly um, because it says right here that, and this is probably a little too detailed, but they have to submit 10 issues and five pull requests and review 20 pull requests. And then they get the next level of maintainership. Um, that would encourage them to invest one person's time in that project more heavily. Um, and if there's no obvious outcome to investing a person, they're probably going to pull that person back to work on other features that they need or other things in their project. Um, so the more clear you can be about how things can work, how governance works, who to reach out to, and how people can grow in your project. And, and maybe you don't have clear 
you know, rules like that, like how much you have to contribute, but you could give examples. Um, you could give examples of, you know, Rich works on Apache and he did all of these awesome things. And then he volunteered to be on the board of directors. And because of that, he, you know, he gets to run Apache con now. Um, like if, if you can point out examples of how people grew into different roles, um, that's also really helpful. Any, any examples people have or any confusion they've run into there? Okay, the next one, I said I had to have a slide on this. Um, security is usually a really big issue for companies, especially if they're shipping a product that depends on your project. Um, and and I, I don't wanna say they get touchy about it, but it, they take it very seriously. And what I would encourage open source software projects is to leverage that because companies are willing to invest a lot of people and effort into making sure all of the security problems are solved um, for all of their dependencies. and. I've been really surprised. So I, I've worked in open source at a number of companies. I've also helped companies' customers. Um, so at Red Hat and at Microsoft, I've helped um, customers understand how open source software works. And security is is not usually something they think about, and not usually something they have any understanding of how it works. They they just expect to be notified when there's a security issue, and they don't realize that there's another team that's probably been working on this issue before um, the broad notice goes out. That, that just doesn't seem to jive with how they think open source software works. Um, so I think letting them know, and I think you'd often find they'd be willing to put somebody on the security team, probably somebody with a lot of experience and somebody who would be a great asset for the project. Um, we've also had the case, um, this happened at Microsoft, we had a security team very purposely. We wanted somebody on the security team for this project. It was a dependency we had. Um, and that person left Microsoft and in an oversight, we didn't realize that we had lost our person on the security team, um, which obviously we did. That person might even have stayed on the security team, but they no longer worked at Microsoft. Um, their role on the project was independent of their job. And we would have we would have nominated somebody else or requested that somebody else be put on there. We would have put more resources on that project security um, team if we had known that. Um, so I think being really clear to companies how security works and feel free if you, if you know someone on your security team left the company, asking them for more resources, um, I think they'd often be very receptive to that. Any thoughts on security or any issues that anyone has had around this? Um, the other thing I think that projects could ask companies for is customer requirements. Um, so it, it used to be um, when open source software was first getting big, um, most of us worked on a project where we were scratching our own itch. Um, so we were working on a free and open source software desktop and all of us were using that free and open source software desktop. So when something was wrong with it, we saw it. When something was missing, we noticed it. And, and so we were our own, we gathered our own requirements and we fixed our own problems. And these days with cloud software, um, and massive storage and solutions that, that run across, you know, many machines and many problem sets. It's not always obvious what the, the use case, like not the use case, you know what the use case is, but it's not always obvious what problems or what features would be, what problems need to be fixed or what features would be most helpful. And I think um, companies put people on, you know, product management. Um, their full-time job is to go out and talk and to people and find out what they need. Um, they have people in sales who are actively trying to sell their product to customers and, and hearing what it does and doesn't do for them. Um, they have people in support centers who are taking calls, um, hearing what doesn't work or what's really hard to install. And I think asking them to share that information in some form um, would be really helpful, especially if you're not the main product they're shipping. If you're a dependency that they have, I'm sure they'd be happy to share like all the things they wish were different or better. Um, and you don't have to promise to fix them. Um, you could just ask them to just share that information. And I think um, SIG's um, special interest groups are a really good way to get multiple companies together to share those requirements or those problems or those issues, those pain points. And then I, I've talked a lot about how you should share with them how things are going and, and where things are going. Um, but I. I think it's really important to ask companies how things are going. And this is part of like getting the requirements um, out of them is like, ask them like, so you, you, you've been, 
lurking on our mailing list. Um, how's it going? Are you are you using our software? Um, would you like to participate? Do you know how? Um, do you feel like you're getting information you need? Is there something that I could provide or give you that would help your management um, sponsor us? Like that would. Um, so anything you can, you know, feel free to ask them what would help them help you. Um, and feel free to ask them for things you need. Like if your security team needs more help, ask them if they'd be willing to do that. If your conference needs an organizer, um, feel free to ask them that. Wow. Bigger the ask. I don't know if you guys have heard the, the fundraising tip that if you're trying to ask for money, you should ask really big first. Um, and they did this experiment where um, they had someone go door to door in a neighborhood and ask if people would be willing to volunteer to go spend a day at the zoo um, with these kids that had gotten in trouble or, or went to school for, for kids that had gotten in trouble. And they, they were looking for a, a full day volunteering from someone to go to the zoo with these kids. And when they would ask that, um, most people would say no. Like they, they felt totally okay saying no to a whole day ask. And then after they asked that, they would say, oh, okay, well, what would you, would you give $10 to pay for one of the entry fees? And then people would give the $10 easily because they just said no to this really big ask. So the small ask felt like they should do that. Um, whereas when they asked for the $10 up front, um, most people said no to the $10. Um, they should ask for a dollar or something at that point. So, so ask, dream big, ask big. And then when they say no, ask smaller. Um, so I, I would, with all with all fundraising, all corporate giving, I, I would do that. I would ask big and then have something in your back pocket to ask for that smaller. Um, so Rich says, yeah, it's hard at Apache. Oh, we, I got that one already. Cool. Um, and then I think the, the key thing is, is to work together. Um, obviously, the, these people that come from large companies are, are just like me and you. Probably most of us are paid. I don't know. I, I'd be curious if we were in a room, I would say, show of hands, how many people get paid to work on open source software? Um, you get paid to work on open source software, like write me in the chat. Not me, me. I don't. Oh, cool. So the, the people that, that don't, are you, are, are you, but you do work on open source software? So Dave and, and Sharon, do you work on open source software? Yep, but you would like to be paid. Well, this conferences are a great way to network to find people that might have jobs that would pay you to work on open source software. Um, if you see something on the Microsoft jobs, there's quite a few at open source, let me know. I'd be happy to try to do introductions. Um, but, but work together, um, assume they have good intentions, even if they rotate and they're random people that just popped in. Um, I did, I did hear a funny story um, at Microsoft before I joined that a uh, project figured out that Microsoft was going to start depending on their project because in mass, like a whole bunch of Microsofties showed up at their conference. <laughs> they, figured, they figured if that many Microsoft folks um, showed up at a project that they were probably gonna be using and contributing to it soon, and they did. Cool, I see that Dave's mentoring projects. So any, any questions for me or anything that I didn't cover that you would like to have seen covered? So what's the biggest challenge to getting a company to participate in your project? Or if you work at a company, what's the biggest challenge to getting your company to sponsor your work or to sponsor the project bigger? Antum or Christopher, do you have anything? All right, I'm gonna, I'm here for questions. I'm happy to share any knowledge that I have about how to get companies involved in open source software projects or open source software projects involved in in companies or how to get um, companies to be more successful working on open source software. Um, but if if not, I'll just open it to questions or chat. And if not, then that I, I'll let you go.
So you think Sharon says there's a lack of understanding of how open source software projects really work and it's a little scary for them. I, I agree, it's, it's, it's really scary for companies. Um, I worked at an open source software startup where somebody who worked there um, had come there from enterprise software and he would regularly come into my office. We had offices, like real offices with doors. And he would come in and he would say, Stormy, I don't get it. Like, why are they doing this? Like, why are they working on this for free? Um, and I had many a beer with him and I tried to explain many times and I, I just don't think he really got like really, I mean, he understood, but he didn't really understand like why people work on it for free. Um, and and so I, I think there, it, to a company that's spending most of its time thinking about profit and customers and sales, it's, it's sometimes a, a bit of a shift. So Rich says open source is so much more professional now and projects are so much more complicated and it can be so hard to be at the level of expertise necessary to contribute. Um, that's very true. I think, so I, I talked, to, uh, that's what I was alluding to when I said it's really hard to know what the requirements for your project are, or like how people use it. But I also agree that the level of expertise to contribute to a project is, is much higher now and people are much more specialized. So it takes an entire team. Um, and I actually think that means a lot more projects or are groups of companies contributing to it um, as opposed to just groups of individuals. And, and so I think being able to harness those, those corporate contributions is key and getting those corporations to work well together is key. Um, and I actually think groups like the Apache Foundation, the Eclipse Foundation, the Linux Foundation have done really well at getting companies to, to work together on open source software. Yeah, and, and there are differences in projects. So Dave says that no one on open office is paid. And Rich says like on OpenStack, you have to have thousands of dollars for equipment. Um, so it does still vary um, by project. And I think it varies very much by like, is this a project an individual can use? Like open office is a, a single person project. I mean, you might be collaborating with others, but you're running open office on your computer. Whereas OpenStack is, is something you're usually using for a solution that's bigger than a, a one person problem. So it'd be an interesting conversation. So Dave says that um, Oracle and IBM gave to open office and then left. And it, it would be a curious conversation, like are they still using it? Why why did they give? Why did they still leave? Um, like that that would have that would be interesting to, to do to look at in retrospect and would have been an interesting analysis to do at the time to see if, if the open office could have kept them. Thanks, Rich. Thanks for, for joining in the middle of your conference organizing. I'm impressed. So Antrim says for, for new people, most projects they end up working with are mature projects that are too complex and have a higher barrier of entry. Um, the people who used to open source are the ones who explore newer incubating projects, which have a lower barrier. Um, I, I agree. It's, it's much easier to, to start off as an individual on a, on a, project that's new or that you can encompass the whole thing. Um, and there, I think companies, um, corporations contribute a lot by participating in the projects that are really complex. And it takes a, it I, I think we used to talk about barrier to entry for projects. Um, and for, if you want individuals to contribute in their free time, your project has to be pretty simple and pretty easy to get started with. Because um, if I'm spending my evenings and my weekends on this, I'm probably not going to join a project that takes me a week or two to, to get involved in, to get started in. Like, I want to contribute right away. Um, whereas a company can afford that. They can pay somebody's salary for a couple of weeks while they get ramped up and they get started on the project. Um, so it's a different barrier of entry to some projects, and that's both good and bad. So Shane says he's on the board for ASF and he's wondering how we can get Stormy to write the community version of an inner source guide. <laughs> Thanks, Shane. Um, one from the outside of companies that explains FOSS communities, all the ways that corporate teams organize themselves about dealing with the community and about how to ask for money. I'll try to blog on some of those. I've been looking for more blogging topics. So if anybody has any to give me, that would be useful. All right, any other questions or topics? You can find me on Twitter at storming, ST, like the weather, the weather's storming outside. Um, or you can email me stormypeters at microsoft.com. And I'm happy to, to chat anytime about open source software, companies, 
helping open source software be successful. Thank you all and enjoy the rest of the conference. And next year we will meet in New Orleans.